You're watching EVH Gear TV. Official Van Halen merchandise for EVH Gear TV is provided by VanHalenStore.com. Now, here's your host from Ontario, Canada, EVH Gear artist, Eric Broadbent. Hey everyone, Eric here. Before we start tonight's program, I just wanna take a moment to acknowledge someone who's very special to me and very special to this channel. I'd like to uh, say a, a warm thanks uh, for the years of wisdom and support, um, product knowledge, product insight, humor, any, all of the above. Most importantly, the friendship uh, going on almost 17 years. It's a very, very special day, a very special birthday to someone that we all know here on the channel. And if you don't know him, you should know him. My very good friend, dear friend, Adam Reaver from fu-tone.com. Having a very special function this evening that I was privileged enough to have a golden ticket for. And I cannot be there. Uh, I was trying to work out last minute. I was actually gonna be broadcasting my show live from the party tonight. It was going to be about a 10 and a half hour drive or about a 10 hour drive. And I was gonna split the driving with a buddy, uh, get there, broadcast the show, hang for the evening, turn around and come back the next day. But uh, my, my friend has a gig tomorrow at early in the morning, so we just we couldn't work it out. I would love to have been there. So it's my way of saying, happy birthday, Adam. Thank you for the, everything you've done for me, uh, and thank you for the friendship. And when the video is over tonight, I'd like everyone to comment down below and wish Adam a happy birthday. He's the greatest guy. We all love him. So I'm going to turn you over now to our, our regular scheduled program, Already in Progress, which is live with Mark Slaughter. See you soon. Happy birthday, happy Adam. Happy birthday, Adam. Sit down. Hey everyone, it's Friday evening and welcome to EVH Care TV. I've got a uh, great guest this evening, Mark Slaughter. How you doing, man? Doing great, thanks. Thanks for asking. Nice to be here. Uh, great to have you. You just got a nice little kiss off the camera there. What's that? You just got a nice little kiss there off the camera. Oh yeah, my dog is uh, Junior. He's in and out. He'll be barking in the background. I, unfortunately, he, that's what he does. <laughs> no problem at all. No problem at all. I imagine uh, that's probably something, another uh, common bond you share with Mike um with the pups oh yeah a absolutely he you know it's funny because his his dog's name is bubba and that was my original pyrenees i had to put down a couple of years ago oh, so there you go it was like wow oh, that's a trip you know, yeah. same name for them yeah so and that's what you're saying too you had to get back from uh the show last night obviously you take care of uh uh your your pets and everything there as well so sure yeah sure that was it i, I mean it was a great show last night and we had a had a wonderful time and uh um, you know, it was, it was good to see some friends. You had uh, good friends that came out. Adam came out, and, and uh, what a blast! Speaking of which, too, we just had a—you uh, didn't get to see the video intro. You'll see it after if you watch this back. But I had a video intro for Adam there. Um, I wanted to be there for the party tonight. Got the uh, you know the golden ticket in the hand here, but I just couldn't make it. It was a ten-hour drive, and I was trying everything I could do. Um, Melissa was trying to make it happen for me too, to to you know right. arrange to get there. But um, Adam knows we're, we're both there in spirit with them. And you had the oh, absolutely. You had the privilege of being with him there last night, so that was that was good. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah so we could start start the proceedings, so to speak. You know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the the pre birthday, that's good. And it's you know it's kind of nice too because it's just you guys, you couple guys there with him is not so much pressure on him. He can just kind of lay hang back with you too, a little bit less pressure. How did the show right. go last night, anyways? It was good. I mean, it was one of those things. We had a show over in New York, and uh, we had some uh, issues with the venue, and we we uh, decided to make. Uh, lemonade out of the lemons and we uh just went and threw it just a throw and go in a club and you know it's just so old school i just love again the art of making music and just going in and doing it and just getting up and jamming and plugging in and uh you know just just being a part of where i came from you mm -hmm. know it was really cool band sounded great I have a feeling too. The fans probably appreciated that too. A more intimate, um, you know, uh, environment. You know, they get right up front with yeah. you, get in your face, and then it's, you guys feed off that a little bit more too. Sometimes I'm sure with the venues that you played over your illustrious career, sometimes you never see that same face twice. Whereas in the smaller venues, you know, you get to connect with some of these people, and especially the guys that are guys and girls that are really cheering. Yeah, and you know, the, the nice part, and uh, honestly, the the fans of of our band have just been so phenomenal through the years and we've had a, a great experience they've been backstage with us we've you know we've seen seen the world and we always invited people back into it as much as we could and and uh um you know it's just been a it's been a great ride so far that's for sure 
I'm glad to hear it. Well, I've had the privilege of obviously listening to your record again and again and again and again. Um, you know, I got a little bit of an advanced screener so I could get in the zone for the interview here. And, and I've, right. had it, I've had it for a while. And uh, I've been playing it like off the off the charts. When I'm working here throughout the day, I'm putting it on because if I come up with another question for the interview, obviously I like to have the, the music influence me. And I made a couple notes um, uh, fr- from the album halfway there. There's, there's two or three tracks that really hit home. Like I like the full album, but there's two or three that are just like my my unchains of Van Halen. You know what I mean? Like there's oh, those. Uh, thank you. Yeah, yeah. They. I made a couple notes of Hey You being my fave, uh, my favorite one for right. sure. Supernatural and Conspiracy. And I thought I thought Conspiracy to me. No, I mean this might sound silly, but it sounded like a little tiny bit of an Alice in Chains nod to me in the vocals. Is that a little bit? You know. It's funny. It's funny. And again, I come from from the the school of you know. Uh, I used to be a guitar teacher years ago, so it's kind of one of those things. I'm very knowledgeable about how to um, you know, as far as melodic structure of things. Um, it's it, the song because it does this descending chromatic thing. It it needed a third. It needed that you know that top voice over the top of it. And because it was descending in that way, it was very Alice in Chains. Mm-hmm. But it, let's let's not bow out to where the Alice in Chains be, got their thing, which is from Black Sabbath. Yes. So, yep. I mean, you know, so it's kind of like it's that Black Sabbath thing, and then you add just that harmony, which is not a typical thing for Ozzy to do, and that is really the the sound of Alice in Chains. Um, you know, uh, again. One of the one of the few bands from that ilk that I got, you know, Mikey Inez is a is a great talent, and I think he, when he stepped in, it even went further, you know. Yeah. But uh, uh, it wasn't an intentional nod, so to speak. It's just uh, it, I'm a songwriter first, and I always do with what the song asks for. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, that's just kind of where it, it needed to sound a little creepy. It's conspiracy. You don't want it to sound pretty. That's right. Exactly. So, yeah. So you you know you kind of want that not uh, something's not right with this. Mm-hmm. It dictates so it dictates a, a feel. Yeah, I mean that's a that's a thing that I that I do as a as a writer is try to make the music, you know, much like Rush, you know, which is a great band. Love they them. always have their music. They always have their music and their lyrics literally right together. Mm-hmm. You know. Yeah, actually, it's funny they mentioned that too, because obviously a Canadian here. I mean, not just because I'm a Canadian, I'm a Rush fan, and you don't have to be a Canadian to be a Rush fan. They're accepted and uh, you know worship worldwide. But I've been on a oh, huge, huge kick with them yeah. lately too, and uh, listening, rediscovering. We'll talk some vinyl later on in the show tonight too. But uh, getting my boy into Rush, listening to his first records. Uh, well, not one of his first records, but one of his first, Moving Pictures. And we're sitting here listening to that. He's 11 years old. We wake up for breakfast in the right. morning, spinning uh, uh, Moving Pictures, and that's a nice a nice way to start your day. Yeah, yeah, it was cool. I, I mean, I it's funny. I've had this tie to Canadian rock music my whole life. I mean, obviously Van Halen is your all American California. Mm-hmm. I'm from Las Vegas, so it's just a screen door away from from that area. Um, but you know, I I was aware of April Wine and Coney Hatch, and of course Kim Mitchell with Max Webster sure. and and all that stuff. And that was a big part of my life. Obviously, Brian Adams is, was a great songwriter and still is. And, uh, um, you know, we ended up doing one of our, uh, our tracks shouted out in Canada at Little Mountain. That was part of our thing. Oh, there you that's, go. That's what we decided to do. Yeah, because we knew that was a great studio. It's funny that you mentioned just before we came on the air here, too, we were talking about another fellow Canadian that um, I'm a huge fan of. And it's I have the conversation a lot with American musicians, and sometimes they know and sometimes they don't. And and I, I wasn't sure what to expect when I mentioned the name to you and I mentioned Ian Thornley. And, of course, you you perked right up. And, uh, oh, dude, he's 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 been probably my favorite guitar player to go to in the past. Uh, probably, well, I liked what he did originally. I liked his solo stuff, but the big rec ghost record is mm-hmm. just, it's amazing. It's an amazing record, and and again, he, he's he's such a talented guitar player and very underrated and very. You know, I, if 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 anybody's watching this, it hasn't checked out what he does, man. I, again. I buy those records, man. I go on Amazon and I download those things. And when I travel, I listen to it. And Ghost was kind of my soundtrack to not last year, but the year before touring year. I listened to it on the plane. It was just this, just a perfectly done record. 
I, I agree. I agree. And, and he's a really humble dude like yourself, too. And he has a hard time taking um, um, compliments. He just like he doesn't understand it. And I told him sometimes the only thing that he's, that he's overshadowed by is his voice. His voice is phenomenal. Right. You know, it's yeah. like it stands yeah, on its own. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I'm going to jump over to the and chat real that. fast and just mention to say hi to everybody that's in here real quick. And I'm going to uh, carry on with the questions. We've got some and we got some good questions about voice speaking, of which. But uh, a lot of people join in the show tonight. Got Mystic Star, one of our regulars. Zachary Suter, one of our younger visitors. Lyle uh, Ketchum, mm -hmm. MB215, Scott MacArthur, Dirty Apes, uh, Diane Salive, um, family member, uh, Blackie DH, Scott MacArthur, Len Bias the third, Rocant56, uh, Willis Wham, uh, Bruce is joining us, John North, JJ Collins, Scott MacArthur. I may say say these a couple times. Vintage Sounds, Cutter Savage, Thomas Santiago, uh, Blackie DH, Greg Walker, Dan Wilhight. Uh, I'm going to try to keep my eyes peeled for uh, questions, and I uh, have my trusty assistant as well, too, and good friend Darren Moore. He's helping as well um, to find questions. So, Darren, if you see anything that I miss question-wise, try to point it out to me as well. And if anyone wants wants to tag a question for me to see it as well, too, make sure you mention EVH Gear TV and the question, and it'll, it'll flag it so I can see it, and I can ask Mark that question. Um, and speaking of my assistant, Darren Moore, he says, hello, everyone. He says, Mr. Slaughter, he's very polite. He's very, very polite. He's a younger fellow, but he's, he really res right. he's, he's very respectful. He says, love your work. I'm digging Hey You off the new album. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I, I you know, that it's funny because, uh, you know, again, we're all, it's riff driven. It's, it's mm -hmm. a riff driven song. And, and again, if you, if you look at uh, in the EVH side of it or, or any of those classic rock things, or it's just a, a thing about a riff that actually sticks out. And you know, when I kind of when I kind of came up with that riff, it was just that driving old school rock and roll thing that you know. Again, I just wanted to drive it home and keep it real. You know, you did it. You did it for sure. And I know I'm gonna I'm kind of jumping ahead, but I have a note in in the um, the agenda for later on in the evening. Uh, talks about the music, and I really find that you've released a. Um, I don't want to say it's dated because it's not dated, but if you want it to be dated, it takes you back to where you were. It takes us back to where we mm -hmm. were. And, um, you know, there's all these things I've been reading lately. It's like I, the, there's so much negativity in the press when it comes to everything from politics to religion to whatever, and music, of course. And they're saying, you know, guitar rock is dead and guitar is dead. It's like, who? who what are you listening to? You know what I mean? They're certainly not listening to your record well, and some other good stuff that's out like there. Obviously, you're not listening to Big Wreck and you're not listening to what I did and yeah. you know, what everybody else is doing. There's some amazing music out there. And, and, and I think, it again, it's songwriters. And, and again, I, like, for instance, going back to Ian, there, there's a point of you, it's, a, it's a point of still being a songwriter, so to speak. It's mm -hmm. not about anything but being a songwriter. And then the riffs actually go along with that. They create that whole vibe. So that's the key. That's right. And not every song necessarily has to have a blistering guitar solo. If it calls for it, cool. Right. Um, sometimes there's, there's not even a need for a solo. It's like, okay, well, this would be a good section for a solo, but I don't really feel it in this song. Maybe there isn't one. Well, I mean, that's, that's kind of what I did on the first, the first Slaughter record was really driven more about songs than it was solos. Mm -hmm. and, you know, Tim, Tim was an amazing guitar player. But, you know, it was kind of hard for him to hold back because he's like, we could do a lead here and we could do this. And it was like, the song doesn't ask for it. That's and, right. And, you know, and we're, you know, we're one of the few bands. That, I think we're the only band from our genre that produced um, and and uh, wrote and still perform the, that music to this day. Because, yeah. you know, we were self-produced. It was it wasn't a thing back then. I mean, you had producers and writers and all these other people with their fingers in the pie. And we were very lucky to have that musical freedom from the very beginning, which you know, continues in my solo stuff. That's right. Well, here's another example, too, something I'm sure you, you may agree with. Um, you know, a lot of us grew up as Creed fans. Okay, I like Creed, like the next guy. Like, I don't know their full discography. I know their hits. Um, but I was a fan. And then all of a sudden, Alter Bridge comes out. And then you say, oh, who's this new guitar player? And meanwhile, it's the same guitar right. player. The songs didn't right. didn't call for it necessarily per se back then. And you listen to right. Mark Tremonti play, and it's like, what the heck? Right, right. And that's again, it's it's music is, you know, it's an art form. It's a painting, and each one of those, uh, I, I say this often. It's kind of like that musical environment, and it's a timestamp of our lives. Yep. You know, I can tell you the first time, you know, for instance, uh, I heard you know, dance the night away or something. I mean, if that isn't a summer song where you're just, you know, out at the lake and, and having a drink with your friends, I mean, that song is a party. It and is. And that, 
you know, again, I think that there's two sides, you know, on the, in the, on the Van Halen side of it, there's two sides of Van Halen. There was the, the, you know, the front man, which is David Lee Roth, and then the singer, which is Sammy Hager. And not saying that Sammy's not the strong front man, but Dave was, was all front man. I love the way you say that. And, yep, I agree. And, 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 you know, again, I think both of them were, were brilliant and brilliantly done. And, and again, you know, people choose sides and this is that and this is the other. And the bottom line is you're, you're dealing with the process of the time stamp of what they were doing artistically in the paintings they were doing. Yeah. Some people might say they were adding too much blue if you're think, looking at an sight mind of it or too much red when red, Sammy's there, so to speak. Yeah, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, but you know what? Here's the truth. It, it, it was the songs. And those songs are the important part of, of every Every one of these bands and every one of these artists is the songs that take you there. And again, you know, Sammy is a great writer on his own and an incredible talent. And certainly one of my, my favorites when I was a kid, I saw him open for, for Boston. And I thought he was fantastic. Mm -hmm. You know, he, he actually got me into thinking, hey, I can play guitar and sing and be cool. You know? Exactly. And truthfully, you know, when I saw him, I th that's one of the things I saw when I saw Boston. I thought Boston was great, but Sammy... At that time, uh, during the "Don't Look Back" time, he was "Lover Money" was the the you know the the record he was doing at that time. And man, what a great what a great time! It is for sure. And you know what? It's really funny too. Like I have I have kind of a set agenda for the evening, and I, I'm going to totally scrap it because there's things that are, that you're saying at certain points that it really um, make me want to say something else. But and here's a perfect example. You talked about you know the 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 uh, canvas, so to speak. Too much blues, too much reds. I uh, found an article, um, obviously when I have guests on, I like to surround myself in the world, so I did a lot of reading on you and just research and things like that, so I get in your wheelhouse a little bit, and I won't quote verbatim because I don't have the quote in front of me, but you had said something, this was obviously working back in the days with, with Vinny and things like that, but um, you had said, um, you know, uh, art is never finished, it's abandoned. Right. And, right. and I, I really I really knew what you meant by that right away, because, you know, at the same time, us, all of us musicians and maybe in even another environment, uh, painting or maybe uh, video production. It's like, OK. And Mike Himmel will tell you this, too. He's an av av avid video producer. Right. Um, you know, you put your, your heart into it and it's going to be done. You get it out. You release it. You're not it's, you still got some flaws with it. You're not happy with it, but you got to let it go sometime. And well, that's the thing. That that's the thing. It was funny because I have an artist friend out here in Nashville, and and he was doing this amazing painting of this apple. I mean, the apple looked like you could just literally reach out and grab it. And he kept going and kept going and kept going. And he says, "Yeah, I'll have it done. I'll have it done." And it's funny. Uh, I saw the painting about six months later, and it was an orange. Oh, jeez. And I go, "What what happened to the to the apple?" And he goes. I got tired of it and I wanted, I thought an orange would be better. So it's like, you know, you have to just stop, you know, you just, you just have to let it go. And, and it, otherwise it all starts to go into the same. Yeah. You can make an apple, you can make an orange, you can make a lemon. You could just, the point is, is do it all. Don't just do one thing. That's right. You have to know when to stop, and I have a buddy that's into computers, obviously like I am as well too, but he's one of these guys who would like to tweak the computers with software, uh, you know, overclock them, do all this other kind of stuff, and then he'd have combating programs that would come in to do it too, and eventually you've done so much to hop this thing up that it's worse than when you start it off. Right. You know what I mean? Right, you, well, because, you know, the rest, of the, the rest of everything doesn't keep up with it. That's you know? right. You can't, you got to stay with kind of what is working for today. And then go into it. I mean, I, I've, I've obviously I've done my production on my records and everything else. And mm -hmm. you know, I always stay. Actually, I stay uh, in the safe zone, and I'm always probably a couple versions behind uh, stuff in a software because I know it works. Yes. Oh, I love, same, I love to hear that. And it's same thing with you know, you know, you can chase it and you can chase it, but it's the same thing with a guitar. You have to have what you know is going to stay in tune and actually be proper and give you the tone that you want as opposed to trying to just change it for the sake of changing it because it's a new thing. you got to use with what, you know, if I don't have something that's dependable, I get rid of it. I yes. just, it, it's got to, number one, it's got to stay in tune. Number two, it's got to have a tonality of its own or to, to be something that is, a, you know, the next step of a, you know, I always, I always say it as like a horse. You know, if you're a cowboy, you have a horse that runs the barrels. You have a horse that does a quarter mile. 
you know, the point is, is there's all kinds of ways of doing it, and each guitar has its own workhorse side of it. So it's not just one instrument, it's one that does what you need for that point, that recording or that uh, live performance. I, I agree 100%. And I'm one of these guys, too, who always should know better. And you talk about computers and software like that, too. I, I assume you're a Mac guy, probably, right? For recording? Actually, I'm not a Mac okay. guy. I used to be a Mac guy years ago, but I started building my, my computers here and not overclocking it, but rating systems together and doing some pretty groundbreaking things back in the in the day when you people weren't doing it. Mm-hmm. And I actually got ahead of the of just like your friend did. I got over... Uh, extended and doing more than what the 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 software companies could keep up with. Mm-hmm. So I try to stay a little bit behind, and I go for more dependability than I do off. You know, I'm the fastest guy in the block. Yeah, exactly. Well, I made the mistake. Something I always I have a little rule I try to follow. If you don't know the consequences of something, don't do it. Um, you know, mm-hmm. if you don't if you don't know what if you can't predict what's going to happen, just don't do it. And so I'm on. I'm a Mac guy, and for for about a month, when the new operating system on the Mac came out, I think it was Sierra. I think that's the current one right now. Yeah, it's prompting me to to upgrade. Right, I'm like, no, hell no, I'm not going to upgrade. It's not safe. It's right. not tested. Blah blah blah. And and right. I knew the con. I knew the consequences. I knew, or actually, I didn't know the consequences. I knew I was going to screw something up. And I'm a, I'm a tech, so I know what I'm doing. However, um, I, I'm bored one day sitting here noodling with the guitar acoustically at the desk here, and I'm, all right, let's do it. Let's upgrade. And of course, what happened? It crippled everything. It crippled the stuff I use for my show. It crippled my sound uh, drivers. It, it crippled oh, my man. my Adobe apps. Stuff that you know. Oh, yeah. oh man, it's what you need for yeah. business. So, long story right. short, if you don't know what you're doing, um, you don't know the consequences. Stay away. Well, you know what? It's it's funny. I was using you know even my friend Michael Wagner who mixed my last solo record. Mm-hmm. You know he was a couple. Of, he was using like XP. <laughs> Safe. Yeah, I got to go. But you know what? Here's the thing. He could turn it on every single day, and it's a working, you know, it's like a Toyota. You yeah. know that it will work. It's not about having the sexy Jag. It's about having what yeah. you know and the workability in the context of doing things. I also do that with gear. I mean, I have this rule. Uh, if I don't use something in a two-year period, get Very rid of it. Very good idea. And, 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 you know, that kind of always keeps things clean. It keeps things new. It keeps things, uh, how should I put it, um, that it's inspirational for song or for attitude and what you're doing as a, as a player or an artist. And, and it keeps it fresh. Um, there are obviously some things that, you, you know, we all get emotionally attached to things because there's something about it. I've got a guitar my mom and dad bought me, one my dad bought me. I mean, there's, you know. I'll never get rid of those. Mm-hmm. Or you know, I started on those. I taught sentimental on those. That, yeah, I'll never get rid of it, even though I don't touch them much. Yeah. Now, on, on the flip side of that too, new gear, bringing new stuff in is nice when you need it. One lesson I've taught myself too. No, I no longer perform out, but I retired back in 2012. Um, but when I did, a rule I st- I started making from failed, uh, you know, learning is getting a brand new piece of gear not even learning it, and we're talking something that's got some complexity to it, you know, some kind of, you know, thing we got to program or whatever. You take it out, you got a big show, and you plug it in, and, you, and you, everything melts down, and you're just a complete wreck. So I learned from that. Right. You get some experience right. on it first. Yeah, get some. And the other thing is, is there's so many forums, and there's so many things. It's the same thing, you know, with, with, with all aspects, whether it be technology or guitars or any of that. Um, you know, there's so many things in the forums of how we can communicate now, which we never had, you know, yeah. that type of tech support because there's certain things that I found in, in, you know, software programs that, that actually are even more than what you think the software would ever do because you do the research to find that. And there's other additions to simple plugins or other things that are make a groundbreaking experience as, you know, audible or, you know, like what Mike and you do as far as visual. I haven't got into the visual side of it, and and, mm-hmm. and that's something that I'm I, I've got to get into. But you know, I'm so audibly, you know, every day I hear like you know, literally we didn't even sleep last night. We came out, <laughs> rolled out of the club. I I went and returned the the rental car. I flew home to Nashville. You know, I got maybe an hour sleep on the plane, and then you know came came back here, did a whole bunch of stuff, did some things, talked to the agent and all that stuff, and then I. Took a two-hour nap, and my day is has begun again. I mean, it's just kind of where my mind works. 
I know, you know that for I know that for a fact because I was talking to you at nine thirty this morning. I was like, okay, yeah, there's got to be there's yeah. got to be uh, your assistant or somebody because there's no way you're up at nine thirty. But yeah, you no, did no, it. No, no, man, I'm I'm on it. I it's one of those things that you know I I burn out bright. You know, I just go 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 and then poof and then you know I'm out. Then I'm back. You know, <laughs> that's just kind of how I work. Are you a coffee guy? Um, I'm kind of an energy drink fanatic. I, I used to be into coffees and stuff, and then I just kind of found that really wasn't my, you know, it, you know, you start realizing how many calories are in a in a, you know, a frou frou drink with all the whipped cream and everything else, and mm. it 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 doesn't add up, you know. So I I say the sugar free energy drinks at this point. There you go. As long as you don't go too heavy, those things can be dangerous too. I think. Yeah, they can be, you know, they can be, but you know, it's if you Moderation. add up the caffeine and everything, as long as you hydrate, you're all good. Yeah, there you go. Very good. I want to I want to take a step backwards again to to the record again, um, and I I have a, a feeling I know the answer to this question, but I, I, it's not about me; it's about the fans knowing this. With halfway there, um, can you tell us a little bit? Like I find it a very emotional track, um, and you know I've lost some people in my in my family uh, over the years and things like that, and you know friends things like that. Can you tell us a little bit about the meaning of that song and uh, how it come about? Which song? Halfway there. Halfway there. Well, halfway there is 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 a natural course of things. It's 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 um, you were raised by your by your parents. You have these great emotional, you know, innocent days of growing up, and then you lose that parent. And you know, at my age, and there's a lot of other people who are my age, you're losing your parents, and that's just a natural course of things. Mm-hmm. Um. And then it's like you know, here I go. I'm halfway there. And then the next part of the verse of the second song, or the second verse of that is talking about when I had a, a child, which is my kids. Mm-hmm. And then I see them literally hop in a car after graduation and drive away. Yeah. I mean, that's a natural course of things. Obviously, the last verse, which is talking about my mother who's passed away, and I'm gone, but I'm still talking to my child. And I hope you have everything that you asked for. You know, but if you listen closely, you can hear me in the wind. It's just that whole cycle uh, of of life, and yeah. it's just a natural course of it. And it's and I could have never written that song twenty years ago because I had not lived it. But to live it is to be able to sing about it and to be as a songwriter to put it put it to song and to make it to where it actually is something that is uh, uh, resonates to how people have. You know what they go through in life, which is, you know, even my kids understood the song because they've lived a portion of that, so they get it. That's that's very cool. And I I wrote a song too a while back, about four or five years ago. And you know, we talked about Ian Thornley. I shared it with Ian, and he was listening to it, and he really liked it. The song was called "Pass You By," and it's a similar kind of concept where you could be a twenty-year-old uh, kid, you could be a eighty eighty-year-old living in a retirement home or whatever. You're never too old or too young to. Um, to you know, count your blessings, to not let your life pass you by, and appreciate what you've had or what's right. coming down the road, and uh, uh, you know, with loss like that, our parents, like you're probably like me as well too. Like we're we're close in age, um, you know. You think your parents are immortal? Uh, was either of your parents was one more so or uh, more or less influential in your career? Like was your mom more into it, or was your dad, or maybe equal? My honestly, they were both you know equal to my dad. My dad was an old cowboy, but mm-hmm. it's it's funny because he was an electrician by trade. But uh, you know, he really supported it because he knew that was my strength. It was just like a natural flow. And instead of saying, "Don't do this," he said, "You know, by the time you're 25, if you haven't done it, you should join the trade of being an electrician." Mm-hmm. And I was like, you know, that's a good plan. I mean, that's not, that's okay. You know, you can work. And I could still, at that point, I could have still made my music because it's a love of making music. So um, as soon as I graduated, I had a scholarship in music, which I actually passed up because it was more of a choral, Mm -hmm. meaning, you know, for for being an operatic teacher. I didn't want my style to go in a different direction or I didn't want to be a music teacher, although I became a music, uh, a guitar teacher Mm -hmm. uh, prior to joining the invasion. So... Um, it's, it's all musical, man, and we all have to find our own paths. And, and uh, you know, certainly I find I found mine, so to speak, and it's not by accident. It's by you know the support of my parents. I'm very thankful that they both. My mom was always encouraging, and that encouraging word is certainly 
worth just as much as somebody who will you know buy a guitar oh i agree i agree i couldn't agree more with that and with my family like my they both were supportive my mom was the one i would not be doing what i do today if it wasn't for her and my, no, my dad went along right. with it and very similar too my dad was uh, in the trades he was an aircraft engineer and, and a pilot and um, right. he gifted gifted um, engineer, and he said, "Look, you go to school, and there's only at the time there's only one school in Canada up north that I'd go to to take this this course." And he said, "I'll leave you the business. I'll leave you like you know a million dollars worth of tools. You know, I'd like you to pursue this." And and I I had my thoughts for it. I was going to go that route, and I didn't. It was all music strictly. And I, if I could turn back time, I would do it for sure. Now on the other side, right. my mom, you know, when I'm like 12 years old playing, making these you know horrendous noises, you know, I mean, like it makes your hair curl. The noise. That you would hear me playing right she's in the kitchen washing dishes and it was almost like it was a music box to her it was a lullaby and she loved it right. and you know so thank right. god for we have our moms and our dads of course too well i think that it's you know look it's it's hard you know it's hard to to again it's art and that's the hardest part you know in the beginning it's hard to say you know you watch somebody start their first you know stick man paint you know stick man <laughs> yeah. or stick man painting and it looks like a stick man you know yep. that's about where i'd be in art right now if i started but uh you know but as a as a musician you know i've done it for so long it's like chewing gum yeah. you know i i go to sleep at night i've said it many times i go to sleep at night and sometimes i hear music so loud and orchestral things in my head that it wakes me up to the point it's like I got to go do make music or else I'm not going to have the balance in my life. It's almost like it, it has to come through. Yeah. And, you know, I think that that's it's like this universal knowledge and it's no different than what, you know, what Ian does or Eddie does or, you know, all these songwriters and again, not just as a guitar player. There's there's these things that just you have to get it out, you know. Yeah, you have to you have to document it, or else it uh, bundles up. You'll actually lose it. You'll, I'm sure there's been times where if you haven't gotten right on the ball and wrote down some lyrics, or wrote down a melody, or hummed it into a phone or whatever, I'm sure there's probably a lot of pieces that you've lost that you're like, I know I had something. I've done it before too. Well, you know what though? It's funny. Is it's the thing is is you can't chase as a songwriter. And again, I, I've you know I, I've done really well as a songwriter. Mm-hmm. The, the the thing is is you don't overly think of I got to do this I got to do it. it almost creates an anxiety. Okay. It's one of those things of if you've got a cool riff, you know, play it now you can do it into your phone or you can even yes. hum it into your phone sure. and come back to it. So if, if you can make it to where you create the space, you know, just like meditation is is the space between. It's just like how Eddie was is is a is a rhythm player. It was a space in between. It wasn't the fact that he could do all that. Mm-hmm. It was the great stuff he did as a rhythm player oh. I, I, and as a songwriter. Mm-hmm. Those are the things that make you know him legendary in my mind, not because he does the two-handed thing. No, you were 100% but, right on that, 100%. And people have, have lost that just because they thought this was innovative. That's not what it is. You know what's funny? You nailed it right on the head here. And I bring that up uh, every every few times on the show here, the fact that you see all these kids, uh, and I say kids, anybody that's younger than me is a kid, but all these younger right. people out there do, shredding like Eddie Van Halen on YouTube, and there's some good ones, right. damn good ones. However, no. then now you say, okay, well, no, that's cool. You did the lead phenomenal. Let's play the rhythm track. And then, and then oh, I, I never learned it, or I can't play that. There's, the shuffle's too weird for right. me. And that's where he's, right. uh, his talent for... just. Again, it's the background of how how he was raised. Yep. Again, music music is something that is learned, but it's also felt. And so you got to have the balance of the two, and again, the space in between. It's not. It's the, you know, it's it's just like those riffs that there's a there's a space, there's a rest in there. If you're looking at it on a piece of music, there's there's rest in there. You can't just continuously do notes. Full throttle. Again, Ingve Malmsteen's done a great job at that. And I think he's a phenomenal player. And he can also play blues and other stuff. But for the most part, he just just does things that are just go. I mean if it's just like this, that's what it would look like if you look on a music sheet Mm -hmm. and that's not to me it's musical and i get it and it's classically and and it's wonderful but man i'm just i'm still about the songs i'm still about those things that time stamp and and are a part of people's lives that they'll go out and and listen to the music when they're out with their friends on the weekend or or sit around at a barbecue and crank out your music 
I like those moments of being a part of people's lives as opposed to, you know, people, as I say, the, the, the black T-shirts and the angry people that are, you know, looking at you like they can do better when you're playing. Yeah. I, I don't, that's not where I'm driven as a, as a artist. You know, I make mistakes. Yep. But you know what? There's a jazz. Actually, it's a, it's a, it was an interesting thing that happened when I was younger. I grew up in Vegas. And there was a, uh, it was Glenn Miller's trumpet player who came into my jazz uh, band. And he went around to each guy in, in, in the band and, and read the chart down once with each person in there. And he said the coolest thing, and I pass it on as much as I can because I thought it was just so cool. He said, man, he goes, somebody's always got the bouncing ball or the melody. When they got the melody, you back off and let the bouncing ball take it. But if there's a point where you can th go in there and dribble it or go in there and take that melody and bounce it around, you go in there and you get it. And then he said, if you go in there, be fearless. You make a mistake. If you meant to do it, it was right. And that just really at a young age just made it to, for me to be this guy who I don't care if I make a mistake, mm -hmm. I'm not perfect. But you know what? I'll do things that I'll go, well, that was cool because it's those accidentals that take you in the places that you wouldn't go. So as a songwriter and, a, and as, a, as a musician, you know, for, for anybody who's looking, you know, younger talent, just remember to just be fearless, man. Just go out there and just do it. You know, I agree. I've recorded a couple things in, in my life where there are complete, you know, real mess ups in the studio, uh, complete accidents, and event like, and they got left because they actually sounded really good. The producers, like uh, engineers, like this is great. And I listened back to so right. a lot of people were complimenting me on it. I was eventually saying, "Oh yeah, yeah, of course I meant to do that." <laughs> he just because it was so it was so yeah. accidental, but it was good. And I told my boy too. I'm trying to think what he did. He he edited a video with this one time, and he's he's an aspiring YouTuber as well too. And he did this video, real simple thing, a, a one shot type video too, no editing, whatever. Whatever. but the way he did it with the special effects and stuff I was like um, it's it's absolutely amazing you know and he goes it was by accident I said remember this in life some of the best things that will ever happen um, are accidents you know what I mean right yeah you just have to know to absolutely. how to take well, conspiracy him. was written off uh, off this Kramer I don't know if it's in, in the shot here I can't this see Kramer it. right there. Yeah. it's got I, I changed the Demarzio to put EMGs in it and yeah. it hung on my wall for a year and I hadn't played it and I pulled it out and I plugged it in. It was like, uh, uh, and it was just choking. Mm -hmm. But there was a tonality to it that gave me the inspiration to write the track for Conspiracy. That so can happen. I kept, and I took the the EMGs on their last breath, so to speak, <laughs> and I tracked the rhythm track, especially on all the verses, and I kept those original choked EMGs because that was what was inspirational and that was the tonality that inspired the inspiration it's not perfect but that imperfection is what makes it human yeah and that what's cool about that too is it may be on its own like i'm just uh, hypothesizing here maybe on its own it might sound a little weird but mix it with the entire mix i'll say what is different about this what is sounding so sweet and most people aren't going to know it's a it's a bad pickup or you know a weird pickup combination you know there's just something right. sounds really good about this Right, right. Yeah. And again, you know, it, there's configurations that, you know, you can do all day long. I mean, I think that, you know, as far as, you know, there's there's some great pickup configurations, you know, on all aspects, whether it's mm -hmm. Seymour DiMarzio, there's some boutique David Allen stuff I've been really into. Um, you know, there's some great companies out there. And it's just finding those things or whatever it is that fits for the guitar or for the moment or the application, most importantly, mm -hmm. of what that, you know, I've got one Strat, this, this full rock and roll Mick Mars style, and I've got another one that is vintage style, that's Stevie Ray Vaughan all day long. Yeah. So just know what it is. And if like somebody says, hey, man, we're going to be jamming down at, you know, such and such, you want to come down? What are you doing? Okay. You bring the right guitar. You bring the application that's proper for that, for that application. You don't go in there with like, I'll bring my stacks and I'll bring my thing. Nope. You know, I've got an eight watt amp that, you know, Shaw Audio made that's just phenomenal. And, you know, I've, I've used an eight watt amplifier on stage of, of festivals. And people are like, man, your guitar tone's amazing. And it's an eight watt amp. Again, it comes from 
as a kid, again, a bow to Eddie on that, which is I had an old Marshall and I was trying to cop what he did. I mean, when I was teaching guitar at the time, I pulled, had a Variac out and I took two power tubes out and I was <laughs> trying to find that perfect, you know, I was looking for that. Yep. And I realized that even in some of the low wattage amps, you know, some of you, the players out there, try something lower watt because you can obtain some of that breakup at a lower volume and not kill your front of house sound engineer or if you're playing a club that you're drowning out so much that that nobody else can compete and it sounds like crap i agree i mean you're, you're preaching to the choir in that one as well too i'm not sure if you can see them over my head but that's i've got low wattage amps back there too, the 15 watts okay yeah and yeah. I, I i mean i've got the 100 watt right below it and sadly the 100 watt has got cobwebs on it you know if i don't dust it off because i'm not playing it yeah. the 15 watt lunchbox i mean i and i even drop it down to this it's quarter power or whatever so you're playing right. on about four watts, and I could I could do that all day long. Absolutely love it. Right. But I want to go back a, just a half a step when we're talking about Van Halen for a second. I want to get your thoughts on this. We talk about the swing and the feel of them. I've said this a few times in the show, and I'd like I'd like someone like yourself to comment if you think I'm on the right track on this. I, I've said before on the show that I I credit three things for Van Halen's swing sound. Um, what they have in that shuffle, like the I'm the one. This is their whole swing of everything. Um, number one is uh, Eddie and Alex's dad. Number two is right. Eddie playing with Alex, you know, 24-7. When they don't have a bass player, they get up, they have breakfast, they, they play together drums and bass, nothing else. And number right. three, the uh, the R&B and Motown uh, influence of David Lee Roth and the song structure. What would you say? Do, am I somewhat right on that? I, I'd say so. And I think that, again, you know, Alex, to me, is one of the most underrated drummers. I mean, I think he was overshadowed, you know, by Eddie's talents because it was innovative. Mm -hmm. But... As far as his drumming and the things that he was doing, he was bringing some electronics. You know, look, whether you like it or not, he was doing innovative stuff. And and what a, you know, he played to what, you know, let's start at the, it's always a quarterback, man. It's the guy in the back who's throwing the plays. Mm -hmm. And that's, let's start with the drummer. And then there's Eddie out there who's had, he's hitting every play and every run and every, I mean, that was part of the team that made it all happen. And then, you're right, you had David Lee Roth, who had an attitude. He had a, a charisma. He had a way of doing it. And, you know, again, Michael Anthony, his, his, his voice, ult ultimately, you know. Yeah, it was an instrument was in its the own. Van, was the Van, it was the Van Halen backgrounds that were just so phenomenal. I mean, I heard, you know, I don't know, you know, who played on what. Some people say Eddie played the bass or what doesn't matter, man. Here's the bottom line. I saw Van Halen in 1984. What I saw was guys who were a band, mm -hmm. and 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 it was it was it was great. You know, David Lee Roth is you know he's never been one just to go up and just sing the phone book. Yeah. But he was a front man, and and in that when you went to a Van Halen concert, it was a party, and I don't think anybody's captured the party. It's funny, I saw Van Halen one night and the next night was Rush. Oh, we talked wow. about diversity. Yeah. They were, they played on a Friday and a Saturday and I went to both concerts. And it was it was and it was a moving pictures tour by the way. Fantastic. You, you were just talking about yes. off the camera. Yes. Um so so look, it that was a part of of you know the the things that those are the things that that moved me as a young kid is that both of them have a place, whether it be Rush or whether it be Van Halen, but it's the soundtrack of your life. And you talk about you know the swing of Van Halen going back to that. Look, it's it's undeniable what those guys did uh, for in opening the door for first of all Los Angeles and that part of the Sunset Strip and those bands. Yeah, I second of all. Second of all, it opened the door for, you know, for uh, guitar players, whether it be Vinnie Vincent or, you know, or, or Warren D. Martini or any of these guys. He was the guy that kicked, kicked the door wide open, you know, down to the ground, period, with tone, with attitude and that. But, man, those songs are just they're just timeless. I agree. And, and again, those performances were, were, were active and it's. It's honest. Anything in music has to have a believability mm -hmm. beyond the credibility swing, too. Beyond yep. the tracks, it's the songs and the believability. It's not just 
you know, this person's responsible for this and this per- person's responsible for that. It's the believability of the sum of it all, which inevitably is the song and the recording of that song. And man, that took you there. Yeah, I agree. I'm going to jump over to the chat real quick and come back to another um, question that I was just told to by um, uh, my better half here that our good friend, Mike Himmel, is in the chat. So we're going to get to him in a second, too. Cool. I'm glad to see him. He, he told me today on Facebook he might be popping by. Uh, so I'm going to jump over to the chat. Uh, John Norris is Love Rush. Uh, Carlos Santon, happy Friday, everyone. You had another fantastic guest. Uh, thank you, Carlo. Blackie DH, uh, Darren Morris saying hey, hey, everybody. Uh, Cutter Savage, fantastic guest indeed. Thank you. Uh, Doc Tars says, always great guest. Uh, Steve Anderson says, Eric, the 5150 guitar is now shipping. Yeah, that's a nice new guitar from EVH. I love that, the Stripe 5150. All right. Yeah, nice. A satin finish on that one, which is cool. A lot of people don't like it, but I, I love it. Uh, Mark Taylor saying hello to Eric and Mark. Um, uh, let me see here. Okay, this is a good one. Uh, this is a good question. Uh, Wills Wham, uh, hey Mark, huge fan. How did you decide on your live band for the solo shows? Uh, when will the next gig be? Is that something you can comment on? Um, I'm going to do some more solo shows. The live band is, you know, first of all, what was important to me is, first of all, the player. I mean, you, you can start with, you know, with Mike Himmel as far as a guitar player. I believed in this guy for a long time as far as a guitar player. And... You know, from the moment I saw him, I just thought, man, you just never really had your shot here. Mm-hmm. And we've been speaking on the phone. We've written some songs together. We have some stuff that we'll, at some point, release. But, you know, when it came up to, the, you know, the the record getting some, you know, people raising their eyebrows a little bit, I said, you know, let's go out and do some solo shows. My band, which is Dana and Blando and Zoltan, are actually Vince Neil of Motley Crue's solo band. Mm-hmm. So... Half the year, they're out doing shows, and I just thought, you know what? This year, I'm going to create a band that I can go out with. So Bobby Rock from Vinnie Vincent Invasion, which you know, first and foremost is a, all, a longtime friend and one of the most amazing drummers. He is. And you know, to want to talk about a guy, he, he literally has the click and says, man, we're going to pull this back a bit. We're going to, I mean, it's all about the groove. It's all about, you know, when you talk about Motown and all that, he gets that. Mm-hmm. And that's part of the school that I come from of where it's just in the right place. Um, Jamie, uh, the pink man, the pink bass man, he's, he's out here in Nashville Mm -hmm. and he asked to play on my record and I got a chance to see him play. So I brought him on. So I knew three guys that first and foremost are great players and could stand on their own as, as you know, it's funny because, uh, we actually did like a, we were playing in here, we actually did like a rush thing at one point. <laughs> and uh, we actually were doing Spirit of, Spirit of Radio. And oh, I was days. like, man. Yeah, and I was like going, man, this is awesome. But look, ultimately the, the, the band is, is, is it's a great band. And most importantly, I would say to anybody, play with friends, play mm-hmm. with people that you can actually rub elbows with on a tour bus or rub elbows on, a, on an airplane going to a gig and understand that it's not the adversity or 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 the wonderful times. It's it's people you want to share that with, as opposed to just being in a band because this guy is is you know just the guy who's convenient. Yeah, at the hired gun. Uh, no, you know, yeah. uh, no puns, but um, that's the thing. Like you can hire somebody to do the gig, and obviously you want talent. But that's the thing too. That's another reason why I got out of the band thing uh, per se, because the group I was with, we were together for about twelve years. And a lot of members changing, and eventually it's like, oh man, it's like dating all over again. Auditioning somebody, right. you get somebody in the band, then you see this personal side of them is like, oh, what am I doing? Um, so right. yeah, I think that's gelled. I see that with you guys for sure. And Mike's Mike's yeah. definitely a guy that I can see uh, everyone getting along with. Um, right. And, and I mean, he just happens to have a ton of talent to boot. So <laughs> what could you? Yeah, what else could exactly. you ask for? Well, and again, he's and again, he's like myself. He's always looking for good tone. Yeah. And oh, I chasing that, for sure. It's 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 like you know it's funny man I I've got more pedals that are like door stops and then I find like I said if I don't use it in two years it's out mm-hmm. but you know it's it's one of those things you find things that are are important to to what makes a recording or live performance great and that's the most important part of music the tools for that again. You know, when you're talking about the amps that, you know, for instance, Eddie did. Those mm-hmm. are about the amps. I'm using Kemper amps as well. 
and and that's one of the things, man. You can it's like the cloning of an amplifier, and that does some incredible stuff. Yeah, I think I saw so, the Kemper the other day when you guys did the Facebook live rehearsal thing. There, I saw it in the background there. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I, it's there's some there's some wonderful things with all that. Look, I use real amps. I use the Kemper stuff. It's tools again, isn't it? It's a tool. It's a toolkit. It is. Yeah. It is. And we did rehearsals in a very different way. We actually got a rolling kit here. I saw that. And did the Kempers. And we I used this thing, this company that's out of business. They're actually going out. It's called Jam. You know, it's like a, a, a jam thing where you have all these mixers all in and we everybody plugs in their microphones. Everybody has their separate mixes. And then you're not yelling over everything when you're working out parts. Oh, exactly. I like so, that. So it's, it's just kind of one of those things of you're going in there to – make something better not to have uh um how should i put it an attitude of you know this is my rig and i only use this rig mm -hmm. that's no way to actually get to the ends which is inevitably the songs mm -hmm. anything i'm going to drive through it anybody's out there man is about the songs and how it's going to make somebody if you play acdc somebody's going to raise their beer up to the sky and they're going to scream their butts off i mean because it is that it is that party and embrace that for you know whatever it is you're going to do if you're going to be a progressive band then be progressive you know yeah i agree 100 percent. there's a couple of good questions over in the chat as well too um uh, john norris saying do you uh new record is really good i like the song hey you do you did you do all the guitar work mark i did i did everything here and it's funny on hey you on uh, as far as a guitar player meaning you know as mm -hmm. thinking as a guitar player when i was doing the lead i was like getting on there and I was just ripping and doing all this stuff and doing all these really cool trills and that and dive bombs. And, you know, I, I had all this stuff with, you know, with my FU tone, the one that Adam set up with the Tim Kelly's old guitar. And I'm just going to town. I'm just going, you know what, man, let me try it. None of it sounded right to me. Yeah. And I, and I went over and I picked up my slide and I said, maybe I'll just slow hand it. And again, you know, just treat it in the opposite direction. What would happen if I just did a melody? And that was what the song asked for. And 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 again, that's what was the right choice for that song. To not overplay and to keep it slow and to keep it just sexy and cool to where it's a driving force to where, you know, you start using the pedal on the right instead of the, the one on the left. Yeah. So, you know, you want to... You want to go, but it's not always about going faster. It's going accelerating with the right type of speed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. I agree with that. And here's something. I'm going, to, I'm going to put you in the same group of people here to set up this other question that's in the chat as well, too. Um, so a few, a few, several, of the, I, I, almost all the guests I've had on the show could fall into this category. Um, but there's Steve Stevens, there's Gary Hoey, there's the Pete Thorns, the Ian Thornleys. Oh, and, and, and there you go. And yourself. And the reason why I'm setting this up um, as I consider you, you guys, uh, very, very humble. You're grounded. And the question from Carlos Santin says, "I like to ask this of the of the famous guests: How do you stay grounded and avoid the pitfalls of rock stardom that can actually suck a lot of people in?" You know what? I, I've always been very humble in my side because there's always somebody who's equally as talent talented, if not better. Mm -hmm. And it's just you you find the things that you do and you're just honest about where your talents are and you try to grow. And the other side of it is is trying to grow as a talent. Look, I I I, I at one point Steve Stevens, when I left Vinnie Vincent, you know, he flew me out to New York to be part of the Atomic Playboys to mm -hmm. audition for. Him. And he's probably he's such an amazing guitar player. He sure is. And he's so so freaking underrated <laughs> but you know the thing is that i that i was kind of going for i had my own record deal so it was kind of like you know steve i just think i'm gonna go it and do my thing man i've got chrysalis wants to do something here and i i, I don't know if i want to jump in and be you know a part of this when i can have my own thing yeah you followed your and heart again, and did the right thing well, I did the right thing, and again, he he did what he did, mm -hmm. and, and we all have our musical past and where we came from and where we are. That doesn't make it, him any less or me any no. less. It's no. just that it's it's like Gary Hoey. I mean, most people don't know it when he auditioned for for Slaughter, and I sat down with Gary Hoey and I said, "Man, you're one of those guys like Satriani and that. This is not for you. Yeah, you should just do this," and he did. He did that, man, and and what a great 
you know, great job at what he does. He's that, man. He's so good at it. And again, we all have certain things that we do, and those are the, the bright sides. And you just have to go where, if you're a country player and you can do that chicken picking thing, man, you need to just keep going and go forward with it, and not try to chase something that you're not. That's right. Maybe learn it to lo- to put it in your wheelhouse, mm-hmm. but don't make it, don't try to change the spots of, of who you are. Yeah, that's that's true. That's true. Uh, before I go back to further questions in the chat, I had one here as well too for you. I'd like to know um, what you do sometimes for pre-show rituals to get in the zone, and I'll share a funny story with you. This is really cool. This isn't music related, but I had a buddy of mine who was um, a martial arts fighter and like well, like uh, world respected, uh, number one in Japan at the one time, number one in Germany. He's he's an English guy, uh, but anyways, br- British guy. Uh, but you know, world record holder, whatever. And what he would do for a pre-show before they would he would fight is, um, you know, you see all the guys and uh, people. They'd have their headphones on and they're listening to their music and they're, you know, they got the the hoodie on and they're sweating a little bit, pumped up to music. He would do that same thing. He had headphones on, didn't even have an iPod or a player, or whatever, just tucked into his pocket. And he's going through the motions as if he's getting into the beat of the rhythm, whatever. Meanwhile, he just had his own little rhythm and he's letting these other guys get totally. They're actually overexerting themselves before they even fight. And then it would come to, you know, fight, and he'd go and kick their butt two seconds and win. It was all right. psyching people out. Now, do you do anything like that, listen to tunes, or do you? what's your kind of pre-show ritual? Man, you know, I think that it's, it's certain times, like sometimes I like to, sometimes I'll do warm-ups. When mm-hmm. we did the show the other night, man, I just stepped on, we just, we did a throw and go, man. We threw everything up on stage, <laughs> and everything was working. I was like, okay, let's do this. And, you know, it's if it's what you do, it's what you do. The, my pre-show it will, will vary in different sides. Sometimes I think that the the best thing, much like your friend, mm-hmm. sometimes the best thing is is to have the 20 seconds, 30 seconds, just you know, as Bobby Rock says, your Zen moment. Yeah. You know, or 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 your in touch with God moment or something. You just be quiet, man. Just sometimes the answer is in silence as opposed to trying to be plugged in. The yeah. world's not going to all come to you and just plugged in and what <laughs> you're going to obtain off Google or Silver anything platter. else. Some, you just shut your mind down and just be quiet because you can't be in touch with the universe if you're plugged in. It's a different type of universe, man. Yeah. Sometimes turn that garbage off and just be you. Yeah, it's good. Just just detune, and uh, that's why I have a guitar player friend of mine that I, I really respect, uh, Jay Palmer. He's into he's trying to um, he's trying to teach me meditation. I'd love to learn it. Uh, he's offered to teach me, and I'd like to learn that because I think we could uh, you know just have some downtime, get away from the right. music, get away from the computers, get away from you know clients and customers and all this other kind of stuff. Obviously, that's all important in their due time, but it's also time right. to unplug a little bit and um, recharge, recharge. Well, and I think that you know, look, it's it's whether it's in a in a religious side or or just quiet side. Sometimes you have to turn your phone off. Sometimes you have to put the you know Twitter down on the shitter, man. Just for yeah, him, you know, yeah. get into it. Just just bottom line is is just get in the zone of of listening because you can't hear if you don't listen. I agree. You know. And it's it's uh, it's funny when Jamie, uh, the bass player, we were driving home, and it's one of the things he said. God gave you, you know, two years and one mouth for a reason. Sometimes you need to listen instead of, instead of speaking. Yeah. And that's really it's it's such a it's, it's the truth, man. Sometimes it's better just to to listen and and be quiet, and be in it. I agree. It's, it's funny you mentioned, too, putting the phone down, and we can all agree on that. It's really changed. Like, you know, people coming to your concerts back in the day and, and concerts I would go see back in the day, we'd all go see back in the day. You know, we got our lighters in the air and our fists in the air. Now it's like phones, and I'm guilty of it, too. I'll put my phone up and take a picture or a little sure. video because you want to remember Eddie for a few seconds, whatever, right. that kind of stuff. Right. But um, I saw a post on Facebook today. One of my friends, one, his band was playing somewhere, and he was saying he was happy to have a bunch of, uh, of you know friends there to watch. And it's kind of like it looked like a sports kind of bar, right? So because there's tables and chairs and stuff. And sure enough, yeah, the seven of his friends were there sitting at this big table, and all seven of the friends were in one direction looking at a phone. This one's over here doing whatever. They were there to hear their music, but they certainly weren't watching the band. I'd rather have play for the wait staff if they were watching as opposed to everyone just looking at their phone. Right. Well, again, we're we're in a plugged in society. Yeah. I think that you know everybody asks me, well, what do you think about the music business and why is it this way? And that? everybody's so trying to figure this out. Man, just look at the writing on the wall. 
people buy an iPhone twice a year because they drop one in the toilet. <laughs> they and, they and, take it everywhere. And, yeah, they take it everywhere. The point is, is, is that number one, there's an iPhone, so you take you know seven eight hundred out of the, out of the year, maybe fourteen hundred. Then you've got your plans. Then you've got your all that stuff. Then you've got the attachments to it. So what would normally back in the day be your music budget mm -hmm. it's gone yeah people are just they've just put their money in another place it's not like they don't like music but they can't find it so now they're they got this over saturation we've become an attention deficit society if you look at any of the commercials on television the the editing on it is so fast it's because we have become such a point and click Society, give me, give me, give me, in, in, around the world, I should say, mm -hmm. that we are so driven off what's not immediate, we can't sit through it. I we agree. just want it now and there. It's like this this feed of, of 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 just quick garbage, like junk food. Yep. When it really comes down to, like I said, putting that down and really just looking at it and going, wow, it's a blue sky, what a great day. Pick up a guitar and take you there. You wonder why you're not being as as inspired as you were before. Turn your phone off so you can actually play. Yeah, that's right, and and I love doing that as well too. That's why I used to like going golfing until uh, when I when I when I started getting into golfing. That's when cell phones became everyone had one, and I get here again. Right. It goes to show my age, um, but I liked it because you could go out and get away from you know things like that. Or also, I tell my buddies, okay, they got cell phones. Let's shut off the phones, guys. Let's leave them back in the car or whatever. Oh, but I'm waiting for a business deal. You, you'll get the message when you get back there. It's Let's hard. go have some fun right. and and play. And you right. play better. You'd have conversation. You weren't checking. You weren't taking the you know a picture or whatever every two seconds. Yeah, yeah, but then you then you're getting like you know somebody. Hey man, where were you? I texted you and you didn't respond. It's I like, know. You know, it's not. It's like the world doesn't respond in the media side. And I love social media. Sure, I think of course, it's my living too. So. It. But the the thing is for me is is it's it's also. Uh, in some sides of it, for some people, it's almost this narcissistic side society that people are driven because they want to do alonesies all day. They're not selfies, just alonesies all day. Yeah, this yeah. is me alone. I, you know, I, you know, get in the world, man. Be a part of it. Be, you know, go out there and join a band. Be a part of something. You know, freaking rock it. It's not about just being alone, man. The world and friends and the things that matter, your family. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't have your family forever. Get out and you know, yeah. hug them. You know, be a part of it. Yeah. That's again, that's a part of this. And I know social media is a part of this for for all of us. But it's also a point of unplugging to to live. I agree a hundred percent on that. I could I could not agree more. Um, here's a good question here as well too, and actually this is a good segue for us because we we're you and I were talking off the air about our good friend Adam Reeve, and we we're talking about the Futon product and how much it's a, a mutual love for both of us. Right. Um, so this is a good setup here. So uh, JJ Collins says, uh, really enjoying this. Eric Slaughter was and has been one of my favorite bands since day one. I've seen him several times. Tim Kelly was one of my favorite influences for picking up a guitar. So. In the description of this video, I've got the link to the video that you and Adam did, and uh, you know I watched it two or three times, and the and the first time, second time, you know, I had tears in the eyes watching it. Right. Number one, just you know, we can have tears in our eyes just uh, experiencing our guitars after Adam upgrades them, but this was a very right. very special one, and I think you actually have it hanging right. over your head there, correct? That the, yeah, it's a purple one right there. Yeah. I don't know if you see it shot. Yeah. yeah. Could you would you mind would you mind kind of telling us that little story, um, how the guitar had its journey? Um, from Tim and then back to you eventually and then going to see Adam and that special moment that you guys had not only at uh, uh, his his uh, funplex as he calls it and then over at the cemetery yeah. as well tell us that little story right. it's and you know it's it things come in 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 it's life is has all these things you just go man can you believe that's as crazy there's there's several things with with Tim and again on the spiritual side you know that's how I look at things mm -hmm. um, you know we fought over you know, not fought, but we, we, when we were starting the band, Dana and I were trying to figure out, okay, we're going to do this, we're going to get this bus, we're going to do this, we're talking about this, and let's get our gear together. It was when we got the Kiss tour. And I said, you know, I'm going to go get a purple guitar. You know, I'm going to go, that's what I'm probably going to have. And Tim goes, purple's my color, I'm going to get a purple guitar. And I said, yeah, yeah. So as Dana and I furthered on the discussion, Tim goes over and calls Robin and orders the purple grape behind my shoulder comes back, oh, I got a purple guitar, I got a purple guitar. In other words, just it was just kind of that, that you know, it's, it's just one of those things we both laughed about, you know. And so that became his thing, purple. So anyway, fast forward, he passes away, 
his uh, instruments were sold, you know, from uh, from you know his family, and we never saw him again. Never saw any of the instruments. You know, we you know I'd love to have one of Tim's guitars. I wish I could. Da 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 da. I go through life and nothing. And then I get a, 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 a message from Rodney Hardison, who's up in Oregon, and he says, I believe I have Tim Kelly's grape. And no way. I said, oh. And I said, oh, okay. So he comes over to the venue when we were playing, and and he comes backstage, and we he sets the, the case down. I open up the case, and there's Tim's guitar, and I just, you know, literally teared up. Oh, sure. And I said, Wow. I said, that's it. I mean, I know the guitar, like the back. I can tell you know, like where you know a stick hit him right there. Yeah. You know, when you know, and and anyway, Rodney said it's coming home. It's time to come home with you. So the guitar goes home with me. I said, why don't you think about it a little bit? He said, I did. It's it. Let's. I'm gonna send it your way. It's such a nice, you know, nice man for doing that. Um, and a good friend, I must say. Mm-hmm. And he sends it over. I, I, and I call Adam up and I go, man, this thing just needs upgrades. It's got to be done proper. And I know, you know, what he does. And we talked about it. And he goes, well, when are you playing up here? And I go, I'm going to be up in Jersey at this big festival. And he goes, well, just bring the guitar. And I'm like, okay. So I bring the guitar. None of this is thought out in any side of it. It's just like I was going to go up there. He's going to pick me up. We're going to go over to his office. He's going to do the upgrade. We're just going to do a simple upgrade. This is a video. This is what Tim would have wanted. Tim would be on this forum right here talking about gear all day long. This is the love. This is what we shared, talking about this, talking about that amp, a Bradshaw rig, that, whatever. You know, this is what Dan Huff used. You know, I mean, he he loved this stuff. Mm -hmm. So anyway upgraded his guitar and then i said where are we at and he goes well we're right here in yardley in this yardley and i'm like tim's buried like an hour or or like around here so i called up you know jeff who was our promotion manager back in the day and i said which which cemetery is tim at and he goes right over there off of this and so anyway we go over to his grave with his guitar after it's upgraded like as if, you know, hey man, I did this for you. Yeah. And and I carry on this guitar that is a part of my halfway there record all over it. I mean, you know, it's just you know, Adam his product is just amazing, but it's amazing how guitars are this emotional bond and the mojo that people have in their hands and the feel. It just takes you there, man. It's just so cool. Really is. It's a cool thing. That, that was so nice that's when you played how it happened. Yeah, it was just kind of one of those things that go, man, what a what a uh, crazy thing. And and uh, you know, again, life is pretty crazy. And you know, get in there and enjoy it while you got it. I agree with 100% with that. And there's a question in the chat as well, and there's a question I had for you as well, so they echo uh, each other. Um, how did you meet my, we talk about great guitar players, how did you meet Mike Kimmel? I met Mike Kimmel at uh, the Nashville NAMM show. Oh, right on, yeah. He was he was at the boss booth, and, and he goes, hey man, Mark Slaughter. And I go, yeah. And he goes, hey, I'm Mike Kimmel, and da da da. And I go, I go, what do you got there? And he just, he goes, I've got these things. And he started doing a demo of this stuff. And he just starts ripping. And I'm like watching certain things and aspects of his playing that reminded me of Tim, but had the things I loved about Eddie Van Halen, which is one of my favorite guitar players in the world. One of, you know, one of the five influences that that drove me as a guitar player. Mm -hmm. And he's got it all. I'm going, oh my God, this guy's amazing. So we started talking, got his card, we talked, and it was just this ongoing thing of like, wouldn't it be cool if we did this, or maybe we'll do something like this, or we'll record, we, he came down here, we recorded a song that we'll put out at some point, and just, you know, I think that really, you, you find people who strike a heart chord in their playing, and it's just inspirational. Um, you know, kind of like Tim, Tim was like one of those guys that, I'm a guitar player, but there's some people like if like you know, for instance, like Eddie Van Halen or Mike Himmel. It it's one of those things that you go, man, 
this guy is just inspiring. It's an inspiring thing that I don't feel like I have to go out there and play guitar because they're inspiring to just for me just to do, worry about the song. All of a sudden, I kind of get this front man thing. And again, as, as with Vinnie Vincent, I put my guitar down in the stand mm -hmm. because Vinnie Vincent was Vinnie Vincent. You know, He played a little too much, yep. but he was a great songwriter. Great songwriter. You know, just ask Kiss. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, you know? so uh, anyway, so it, yeah, that's kind of the story. That's how it, that's how we met. And, and you know, Tim, I met Tim at a at a barbecue at a friend's house. He says, "Yeah, I play guitar," and he's literally on the barbecue flipping the burgers and the weenies. <laughs> and, and he goes, "I'll show you. I'll show you when I'm done cooking here." And I said, "Okay." So we literally go in, and he plugs into a little galleon Kruger. And I was like, "Wow, this guy's amazing," and. It was one of those things. It's also the personality of people. You've got to be able to rub elbows on a tour bus with somebody. I agree. Because that's really what it what it boils down to. You want to be around friends that you can be around ultimately in any context. I agree. You know? Not just music. Yep. Not just music. Look, Zach Wild, amazing guitar player. You know, he's one of those guys that, man, inherently, I told Zach this. I said, you're one of those guys that, you know, inherently, man, you wake up and you could just kick ass. He goes, don't forget little Timmy. He was a badass, you know. It's because he's still about, you know, everybody who's in this musical community that make music, we all know each other and we all know each other's strengths and our weaknesses, but it's a respect and it's respect to go, that's the guy. You know, Gary Hoey, he's, he's a badass. Mm -hmm. You know, Steve Stevens, underrated. You know, period. Guy can do flamenco guitar like nobody's business. Go look it up on YouTube. Go check him out. You know, there's a lot of great players out there. And it's inspirational. If it inspires you to make music, that's what this whole forum, what, with what you're doing here, is about. Go get a good piece of gear, the EVH gear, mm -hmm. or something that inspires you. That's what this is about, yeah. ultimately. Pick up an instrument, play, maybe record, you know. Yeah, absolutely. And again, you can get a Mexa Strat if you're just sure. starting. Just go sure. get something that whatever gets you in the game. It's your escape. It puts you there. It's your it's your moment. It's your time away from some of the madness. It's it's made some of us, you know, for for a lot of people in this world, it was a one piece of sanity in this insane world that kept us grounded. Music is life. It is, man. I remember what I used to tell people. I, used to, I worked in music retail for a few years, about five years in one store, which was a PV and a Fender dealer. Another one was a PRS sure. dealer. And I'd get parents coming in all the time. You know, my kid wants to get into music. I don't think they're going to mount anything, so I don't want to spend a lot of money. And they you know, get that kind of approach, right? And you're like, well, sure. uh, you know, let, let's talk about it. And you find out, well, it sounds like your kid's really into it. Like, what does he listen to? Oh, Led Zeppelin and Van Halen. Okay, well, your kid's got some good musical talents. What do you want to play, guitar? Yeah, okay. And so I want to spend like 50 bucks. I'm like, no. I said, look, I've got guitars over here that are $2,000. I've got guitars that are $100. I said, let me show you something. Let me hook you up with a guitar. It's 300 bucks and an amplifier for 50 bucks, we'll say, right? You're going to go home with $300, right. $350 investment. What's going to happen is if you buy that $50 guitar or you go to a yard sale or a pawn shop and buy a $25 guitar, you're going to have strings that are six inches off the neck. You're going to bring it home. Your kid's going to cut their finger off. Uh, it's going to be work, which means not fun. The kid's going to quit. You get them something that's playable, that's decent. Uh, they go home. They right. have some fun. They're, they're showing their friends uh, right. a riff they can play the next night. And now uh, six months down the road, bring it back to me and trade it in. I'm going to give you like 45 45% what you paid for it to trade up to the next model. You're not breaking the right. bank. Your kid's rocking. Um, I think that's a, a good way to approach it. It is a good, and you know, especially with Craigslist and the other things that are out there, there's great gear out there. I mm -hmm. mean, look, music retail as we know it is really, it changes on a daily basis. I mean, I, I'm combing, I go into cities uh, and look at Craigslist. I buy, I bought a, a Les Paul when I was going into Phoenix. It was the model that, that Jeff Blando uses in Slaughter. Yep. And it's the same one. It's a funny thing though, and a funny story of that, now that we're talking about gear, I love, you know, some of the things in his tone are, are really good. But the funny thing is, is when I came out there with the same left Les Paul, same year, and we started playing together, his tone canceled my guitar out <laughs> because it's in the same frequency. Yeah. And then you go, oh, what an idiot I am. That's why the Stones, that's why Aerosmith, that's why everybody in different bands have guitar players. One's a Fender guy, one's a Les Paul guy. 
or Rickenbacker or whatever is because it is the blending of the mixing. If you have it to where it's all the same, the frequencies of the waveforms, they're all going to be the same. Mm -hmm. One guy take this level, one guy take this level, and then you know the bottom line is it'll sound better. So any of you guys in, in bands that are trying to blend something, maybe somebody needs to switch over to something that might be a little brighter tone, and it'll blend better, and it'll mix better. That's that's what I learned out of that experience of of simply buying something off Craigslist. Yeah, yeah, and and stuff is so affordable these days too. Even with uh, you know imported stuff that you know you can start off with a brand new affordable. But here's a band. Uh, tell me what you think about this. And I've never not once on the show mentioned this band's name. And I'm not the biggest fan. Uh, but I you know if it comes on the radio, I'm certainly not going to turn it. Uh, John Cougar. And John Cougar is a perfect mm-hmm. example, I think, where there are so many different things in that band. You got acoustic guitar, uh, you know, dirty fenders over here, maybe some Marshalls over here, and you hear every right. single instrument, and it's beautiful. Right. Well, the the, the engineer, George Tucko, God rest his soul, he just passed away not too long ago. An amazing engineer. He engineered those things. Okay. And it was it was also the separation of how you hear it, how you record it. He did the first Vinny record. George oh, did. Okay. So. So, um, you know, again, it's the engineer who understands the placement. You know, here's it, it. Look, if there's a 100 hertz wave and everybody's in the 100 hertz wave, you can't mix it. You've got to, you know, everybody has to realize where's your place in the frequency span, mm-hmm. which is also, if you look it up on the internet, is, is where the frequencies are, are against the piano. You've got to find your space so that it blends well. And that's ultimately what's important is how it blends. Look, if you're Eddie Van Halen, you don't need another guitar player. It's no. going to be Eddie Van Halen. He's one of those one guys that can do it. Alex Liveson, same thing. Mm-hmm. There are those guys. But then there's these other guys, Joe Perry and Brad Whitford, who found the balance. That's just amazing because they're working together to find as a band to keep the songs coming forward mm-hmm. again about the songs first and foremost and then it's the sound of the band to audibly be in the right places perfect yeah a nice harmony would not necessarily harmonizing but in harmony with one another you know working right. very harmony, well and and also not taking somebody's guitar space as far as their tone mm-hmm. if, if you're all competing for the same place one guy's gonna win that's right and that's not it's about it's about the blending. Music is a dance. It's how it dances together. The way Eddie and, and Alex went together, it was a dance. The way that, you know, Getty Lee and Neil Peart played together, it was a dance. You know, Ian Thornley with, with Big Rec. Man, I mean, the, the, all those guys, are they all have their place within Big Rec that make that stuff sound great. Go check out, you know, some of those videos on YouTube. Discover Ian. Man, I'm all about talent. That guy is talented. Yeah. And 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 not just don't just check it out on YouTube. Go buy the record, mm-hmm. man. I buy this stuff. I I have I buy Amazon stuff on Amazon all the time because that's the new medium. Hard part of it is is you know as a musician you may create a CD, and you know Ford stops putting CD players in their trucks. CD uh, computers are out of CDs and, and yep. you know the places to plug that in. Everything is going to be gone. Product is is basically disappearing. Now, it's on that that uh, that note, are you a vinyl guy? Are you going back? Like, I know you have vinyl with your new I, record, but... I, I made this record for vinyl. Good. I mean, that's the, that was the mindset that I thought, you know, I'm just going to go completely old school. And there were songs that didn't make it on the record because vinyl has to be a certain amount of time on each side to actually not turn into a two-album thing. That's right. Because there's not enough room on it. Mm-hmm. So I wrote this record so that it was in that perfect side of playability to one side to the other side so that the times were right mm-hmm. you know it's right in that perfect sweet zone to where it just sounds great man i'm real i'm very very thrilled on the end result of how halfway there sounds on vinyl it really turned out great i want to get that in vinyl for sure i'll pick that up to uh, listen with the boy we're obviously just got back into vinyl that was, that's all i had as a kid and that's how I right. cut my teeth, you know, picking up the needle, dropping it down, you know, and, and learning my guitar riffs and even eight track, well, believe it or not. But it, yeah, it's different. It's a different. There's an, another thing with mastering. And, you know, some people out there, if they're not familiar with it, you know, when you master for vinyl, you have to create that space. Mm-hmm. So in other words, 
when it's when it's a CD, it's mastered totally different, and it is louder. But if you looked at it on a scope of of where the waves are, what people don't realize if you have a wave like this, mm-hmm. and you're squashing it down in a brick, they call it brick wall mastering yeah. or limiting, and you squash it like this, it's cutting the top of the wave. A square wave is distortion, mm-hmm. and that's what you're doing to your ears. If you can make it to where the waves are rounded, it's going to sound better. It, it's warmer, you know. There, I mean, there's there's all kinds of things out there. There's also the tuning of 40, 432. I don't know if you yeah yeah that 432 does sound better than 440. The only problem is is some of the software that you use it might be tuned to 440, and if you know if you're using like a keyboard or something that's a plug-in. It, it, sometimes you can't tune those things. Yeah. It becomes a nightmare to try to get things to line up. But it does sound better. I, everybody go check out the difference of 432 to 440. Um, you know, it does make a difference. I've heard people say that the, the, the conspiracy theorists saying that's why music was supposed to be. Um, you right. know, if, I, I don't know if there's merit in that, but um, what do you think? Well, I do think that there's there's it, there is proof, and if you look at you really look it over on that side of it, it does sound better. Mm-hmm. You can play something at 432, and you can play something at 440. You can play just open G chord and all that. It does sound better. Okay. But the thing is, is the world functions in 4 440. It's kind of like Mac and PC. Yeah. The world is a PC world, but you know Mac is certainly more creative and and, and better for certain things. And I know it's a lot more of a plug and play and go, but it is also a very, how should I put it, uh, commercialized and, and, and you're, once you're in the Apple, you're, you're, trappled, you're trappled into it. You yeah. have to use that product. <laughs> you have to use all their stuff. I mean, you can't be like a Chevy guy where you go in and go, here's the 350, here's a carburetor, don't like this carburetor, here's a new carburetor. You can't change those things. It is what it is. I agree. I agree. We're getting close to the 90 minute mark. So there's a couple of the questions I want to ask. Um, this is from a fan question. And you mentioned we've both mentioned uh, Ian Thornley a few times. So I had Ian Thornley on the show last week. And this is through the uh, EVH Gear uh, TV Facebook page. Jason Jason Walsh said, oh, I missed asking Ian a question. I, I definitely want to ask Mark a question. He said, you guys were his, t- you and Ian are his two favorite artists. He, um, you kind of alluded to this a little bit. But he says, "How do you approach songwriting?" And um, yeah, I, you kind of dropped some hints on that throughout the night. But just an answer to his question: How do you approach it? How do I approach songwriting? Mm-hmm. I think each song has it has it has its own. It's like each one is a child, okay, and it goes in a certain way. And it can be either good, it can be bad. You don't know. You just have to just try to make it to where it goes in the best way that. It's going to be finished and done, and then when you're done with it, be done with it, yeah. you know, and move on to that next that next thing. A songwriting is is can be can happen from a riff, like conspiracy was for me, mm-hmm. or it can, it can happen from an idea, like halfway there, which is the idea of the song before it was written. This is how wouldn't it be cool to have this? And I wrote that with Bill Jordan. It was that that type. Those are the things you. You walk in with those ideas, or you have it. If, whether you're doing it on your own, half the record I wrote on my own, half the record I wrote with other people. So you know, you find that balance of people who are like-minded in writing, and it's the same thing of to the end of the song to just get it done and not overthink it, and then move on to the next song. Perfect. Or know that you've got if you've got a bridge. Let's say you have a bridge and go, oh man, that bridge is so cool and the melody is so cool. But the rest of the song just doesn't deliver. Take that bridge, almost like a Lego, mm-hmm. put it over to the side here and wait till there's something that that fits with. Yeah, I like that. And at some point you'll find it. You'll find that little thing. Go, oh, I've got that one thing, and you just slap it on there and it'll all work. I like the Lego analogy. And uh, isn't it kind of funny today? I mean, uh, you know, I play Lego with the boy here once in a while. We haven't done it as much often as we, we used to. But uh, it, uh, aren't they spoiled today with the amount of Lego pieces that they have? I, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I want to play you know, Lego again. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's funny, man. I, You know, my, my boys are both both older. But, man, I, I, I can't, can't tell you how many times I've cussed stepping on those darn things. In your bare feet? <laughs> oh, I know. It's the worst thing. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you know. It is what it is, but you know, look, it's a creative process, and it all—it's part of this world. I mean, it, you know, music, it, and especially when you get into the MIDI world, becomes almost like a Lego mentality. I agree. Yeah, it is a, 
one three five and the way it's actually structured within that. Um, so it's it's you, you have to look at it as a visual side and also a creative side. I think so. And what we'll do, we'll wrap up here in a moment, but I, I wouldn't feel right if I let you go by not asking this. Um, I've read that you're involved with um, several charities. Can you tell us a little bit which ones that you are involved with and maybe how you became involved with them? Well, there's one which is the Red Circle Foundation, which is uh, for the special ops guy, Brandon, Brandon Webb. He has SOFREP Radio is uh, doing that. And it's basically government gap funding for our soldiers. That's one thing. Okay. Uh, here in the United States, and, and and first and foremost to me is St. Jude. I mean, St. Jude is one of the things that I was actually in the board of Radio Cares, along with some, you know, some one of the Nelsons as well. I mean, it's just one of those things of St. Jude actually makes a difference uh, for these kids' lives who who don't wouldn't have those opportunities to to get the care that they do. I mean, eighty six cents of everything that goes to every dollar. 86 cents of that actually goes to the charity. So it's not wow. like a lot of charities where they, they just stuff the administrative side of it and make money off, yeah. you know, yeah. please give now. They actually are making a difference. And, and you know, that's that's the way the world should be. It should be for the right reasons and not chasing a bunch of grants like a lot of the, you know, the the college community or, or, or should I say the college hospitals they're chasing grants as opposed to chasing cures. And St. Jude is a, is a wonderful, wonderful charity. So if anybody's looking to give to something that's going someplace, I've been there, I've seen it, and I know it's real. Well, that's good to know. And, and it's funny that you mentioned St. Jude, too, because I've had several other guests on here that are a very um, charitable conscience. Uh, and they, it's St. Jude's comes up again and again and again. So obviously, it's uh, you're on the right track. Well, it's, you know, ultimately it's this, it's, it's real. It's not hyped. You know, it, it, they are making a difference. I mean, if the, if somebody's, you know, for instance, uh, a, a family is out of money, there's no insurance, they actually pay for it. So, you know what, man, they should have it. There should be some point to where these kids have a shot to live and live the lives that we've li- mm-hmm. lived and, and see the world. And, you know, that's kind of where I'm at. Like, give them the opportunity of life that we've had. Mm-hmm. And there's, again, they're, they're, they're doing miracles. And, and uh, if you get a chance and go check it out, you know, go do a tour of the hospital. And then you'll see it's real. Yeah, I'll bring it home for you very quickly. Yeah. 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 Fantastic. I see some people in the chat talking about, uh, you know, buying the CDs or buying records. Uh, your, is your record available um, signed as well, too? Or is it, uh, can you get them signed still? Yeah, you could. You know, sign is going to be done. You could do it through uh, um, the markslaughter.com. Mm-hmm. Um, there's also the EMP label group, which is again that's David Ellison from Megadeth mm-hmm. that we're doing records through him. There are there is vinyl available through there. Okay. Um, there's a picture disc. There's uh, vinyl. Um, you know, it's kind of again this is an independent record label, and it's with one of my dear friends. Dave Dave is a great player and has a good heart, and certainly has been, you know sporting metal for a long time sure has. and uh, and uh again i think it's just really the sum of it all of everybody who still loves doing it of doing it together and certainly he's he's been a uh he's been real inspirational on that side of it so we're we're glad to be aboard oh that's good well, i have the link to your website down below in the description as well and i have the link to your facebook group as well too i'll definitely pick up the uh, signed vinyl because i know junior will love that as well too i mean i'm not gonna lie i'll love it too uh, but he loves yeah. loves vinyl, and I mean, now that he knows that you've been on the show, he's going to love the album that much more, too. So he's right. a real rock right. and roller at heart. So um, so I don't really have anything else to ask you. To. I do Actually, I do have a bunch of questions, but I'm saving them for a rainy day. I'm going to have you back on another day again. If you'd like to come back maybe towards uh, the end of the fall or something, whenever you're free. Yeah, well, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Listen, you know, it's it's the love of music. It's the love of, of, of gear. And again, you know, there's so much great gear out there. Sure is. Um and 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 there's so many inspirational things and and again you know much of like the evh side whether whether it be the amps or even some of the pickups that have been you know that i even use on the the re- reflections in rear view, rear view mirror mm-hmm. i use uh, one of the uh wolfgang pickups on that love that pickup. again, yeah it's just really there's a nice bump in the middle of it mm-hmm. and again it's one of my ponies. It's one of the things that does what it does in, yep. in, in my stuff. I know I can go to it for that, song, that tone. Mm-hmm. So, 
you know, find it, look for your tone, find your tone, and and uh, you know, be be uh, innovative. Brian May years ago used to put epoxy in his in his his red guitar. I read in Guitar Player magazine a million years. He used epoxy to ground it out. That was part of his tone. Wow. One of my old guitars literally has epoxy. It's ugly as sin. Yep. But you know, it did. It actually made it microphonic, and that's part of his tone. Yeah. So. That's amazing. Find it. Whatever the, whatever the it, tricks are. It, find it. Yeah, find <laughs> it. There's forums and just get in there and find it, man. And and, and be be artistic and find your voice. You F- know? Fantastic. I'll say goodbye to the last few people over here in the chat. Um, uh, Rocamp56 has a great show tonight, Eric, and especially Mark. Thank you, Rocamp. Uh, Cajun Jim Kelly. Uh, uh, oh, this is the last, last question for you. Do you listen to hip hop or country? Um, not really. No. I, I don't. I I I I I did. Uh, Dixie Chicks had a record years ago called uh, "Wide Open Spaces." I thought that was a pretty decent record, mm-hmm. but it was the songs. It was yeah. the songwriters here. It was the songwriters here in Nashville. Again, it begins with the song, and that was. Uh, I, I was turned on to that from the Nashville Writer the Songwriters Association (NSAI), and uh, the, they're great. They're doing wonderful things for uh, for us songwriters for sure. Oh, good to, good to know. Uh, Amber H says I'm new here and will return great job Eric love this show thank you Amber I appreciate that uh, Dirty Ape says thank you Mark going to check out the new album this weekend thank you Darren Poison and Eric great show um, and Darren says uh, thank you for watching Dirty Apes but, uh, but Eric and Poison are the reasons why this show is possible I have to b- give a huge thanks to Poison that's my better half here she's been very very sick lately and uh, she's a real trooper tonight she shouldn't even be up right now so um, she's uh, she makes this show possible and she's uh, uh, we talk about our moms and things like that well she's as supportive and then tenfold what my mom was like she really supports me doing this music and right. this talk show thing so hats off and thank you baby uh, let me see here Greg Walker um um, vintage sounds. Good night, guys. Awesome show again. So listen, I'm gonna say goodbye to you off the air. I'm gonna uh, turn it over to the little man here. He's gonna give us our little outro in a second. But I'll uh, okay. I'll, I'll send an invitation to you towards the fall, whatever, whenever your schedule permits. Where are you off to next? So let's give us a quick wrap up with that. Uh, the next next show is next week, uh, Thursday at uh, Summerfest in Wisconsin. Nice. And uh, we're and then we're gonna be uh, doing plenty other shows in July, as well as the Bang Your Head Festival in Germany, which is like I think there's sixty. 9,000 tickets sold right now. Nice. So that would so be fun. I'm looking forward to that. And uh, again, nice to travel the world, nice to see it all. Yeah. But, you know, it all begins right there and in, in, uh, just jamming in your old, in your studio and in your, your quiet space. Yeah, that's right. Awesome. Well, that sounds like a great summer ahead of you. I'm really happy for you. And I really oh, uh, thank you. I appreciate, especially you coming on the show, but especially after you just played last night, you got two hours sleep. Uh, so it's uh, I'm very, very thankful and appreciative of your time. And I, I had a great time with you this evening. Well, thank you. I appreciate it, too. And again, you know, thanks for again. I think that, you know, there's some some good stuff out there that, that you guys are ta- talking with these other uh, guitar players. And, you know, certainly glad to be a part of uh, uh, any of these uh how should I put it? Along with my peers. So yeah, nice. Yeah. Be out there. I love that. Okay, I'm going to turn it over to the little man. He's going to give us uh, his uh, good night here, and I'll say good, I'll say bye to you off the air. Right? Hang in there for right, two you seconds. Got it. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. I hope you're ready to yeah. warm up your weekend, and we'll uh, we'll talk to you real soon. Go uh, go right. grab Mark's record right away. Cheers, everyone. My name bye is Eric. i guitar. Video production services provided by Design Thirty Nine Media. Visit design39media.com for all your website, photography, and video production needs.